You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners. This is a special bonus uh, bit of audio for everybody. A little bit something extra. Back in August last year, we (laughs) were at DragonCon. I guess August, September. Yeah, September. Yeah, rolling into it. We were at DragonCon. And one of the things that we got to do at DragonCon was the Paleontology Hour panel. Mm Mm-hmm. With Trevor Valley and Karen Henning. Yes. Which was awesome. It was wonderful. So much fun that it was two hours. (laughs) (laughs) And because we anticipated it being a lot of fun, we recorded it. Yes. We had our recorder plugged into the system to get the whole thing on audio so we could release it for our people who weren't physically there in the room. Yes, thanks to all the DragonCon tech people. And now that it is the next year, several months later, we have the audio. (laughs) Apologies for the delay. (laughs) Took a little while for us to find the time to get through editing. It's just part of the... the, No, you see, it's just part of the the way things are done. It takes a lot longer than you think it would. Oh, yeah, no, the industry. Yeah, the industry. This is industry standard, (laughs) uh, you know, half a year for (laughs) two hours of recording. So we have the audio here uh, minimally edited. So it it is a live recording, which means what you're going to hear different from most of our episodes is... The volume's going to be a little wonky Yep. as audience members pick up the microphone, which we've modified a little bit to make it a little nicer for you. Um, you'll hear us stumbling over our words. We probably say some things in here that might not be thoroughly researched and accurate because yeah. it's off the top of our heads. Because we don't, yeah, we don't have notes in front of us. We're answering it as people are, that's because that was the whole setup for this was people asking questions, us giving the best answer we had at the moment. So this is a two-hour-long panel of audience members asking questions of us. Uh, originally, it was scheduled; it was slated to be the two of us and Trevor, mm-hmm. who is a super cool paleontologist uh, who's on the social medias and stuff. And then, as we were getting set up, Karen Henning, who is a science illustrator and paleo artist, came over to say hi to us. And I think it was Trevor who asked why she wasn't on the panel. Why aren't you on this panel? And she said, "I don't know." And we went. Well, there's no moderator, so yep. <laughs> apparently we're in charge, so get on up here. Yeah, they didn't put anyone in charge of us, so... So do you want to be on the panel? So she was uh, the bonus <laughs> surprise, which was awesome. Oh, she's, was, she's, I, I she was, was so playing. excited we got to do that. Well, that's enough intro from us. We will uh, let you get into the panel itself. Yeah, enjoy. It'll be like you were there to the begin with. Hello, David. Hi, Will. <laughs> <laughs> We're recording, so we have to start that way. So, uh, Will and I are the hosts of the Common Descent Podcast. Does anybody out here know the Common Descent Podcast? We were getting waved at. Oh, Hi, that's cool. like four more hands than we Hi. expected. That's real cool. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, yes, we are recording this panel. We have our, our recording device tapped right into the feed, so hopefully that works out nicely. Uh, so, go ahead. Let's introduce ourselves. Absolutely. Which end do we want to start on? I'll, I'll Wait, start. Some, somebody left a phone from last panel, oh. so and they're calling it, so one second. Hello, science track. <laughs> uh, no, um, somebody left their phone uh, from the previous panel. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, after the panel in uh, Hilton 210 to 11, so in approximately an hour... No worries. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> well, I don't think we could ask for a better start than that. Excellent. I was asked to keep it clean. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Will Harris. I am one of the co-hosts of the Common Sense Podcast, and I have my degree in paleontology and currently am a tour guide up at the Gray Fossil Site in East Tennessee. Ooh. <laughs> nice. My name is David Moscato. I am the other co-host of the Common Descent podcast, also a degreed paleontologist, and also uh, I am at the Gray Fossil site. I am the science communicator up there currently. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm Trevor Valley. I am not a host of the Common Descent podcast. Um, I am a uh, career field paleontologist and mitigation paleontologist, um, and I'm well. I'm not at the Great Fossil Site either, but it's a really cool place. <laughs> it is. My name is Karen Henning, and I am your surprise panelist for this evening. <laughs> I'm a scientific illustrator and visual science communicator, and this past winter I was the illustration intern at the Raymond M. Alf Museum of Paleontology in Claremont, California. So uh, last year, Trevor and Will and I were on a panel called The Science of Jurassic World or something to that effect. Uh. And uh, <laughs> it started out about Jurassic World, and it very quickly just turned into paleontology Q&A. So that's what we're going to do today. This is paleontology Q&A. So do you Wait, have, without, without the Jurassic World stuff, though, Without right? the Jurassic World stuff in it. You don't okay, need cool. to ask us anything about Jurassic World. Please don't. Really, it's fine. <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> yeah. It, it, um, and there's one hand already. He's like, he's gonna. You had a question about Jurassic World, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, to be fair, it is. I mean, it is kind of our dream to have paleontology in pulp culture. I That's mean, yeah. I mean, or nightmare, or nightmare in this case, <laughs> depending on which movie in the franchise you're talking and about. And it depends on how we handle it. Well, it's a classic case of be careful what you wish for. Right, right. Well, I mean, it's either Jurassic World or the Good Dinosaur. <laughs> Grown. So, did you have a question up here up front? <laughs> what is what Jurassic, is Jurassic World? World? Mostly terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the panel. <laughs> and we're done. Wow. Um, Jurassic World is a movie uh, with really bad dinosaurs in it. It does yeah. have really bad dinosaurs. Really that's bad true. dinosaurs. Fun action, bad dinosaurs. Yes. Yeah, so very non scientific, bad dinosaurs. How many of you would cl consider yourselves dinosaur fans? Excellent. Nice. How many of you have a favorite prehistoric creature that's not a dinosaur? Ooh. Excellent. How many of you have a question about paleontology that you would love to have answered by a panel of paleontologists? Cool. <laughs> Let's start going to those people. Right on. <laughs> Pick one, and we'll answer some questions. Hello. Hello. The, bront the brontosaurus. Is it real or not? Ooh. Yes, also. No, also, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we think. <laughs> so there kind was, a, back yeah. in the late 80s, there was a, a very famous paleontologist named Othniel Charles Marsh, who, among others, was running up and down the west of the United States naming dinosaurs. And he discovered this cool, giant, long-necked dinosaur, and he named it Apatosaurus. And then about a year later, he discovered another cool, long-necked dinosaur and named it Brontosaurus. And then uh, museums happened, and Brontosaurus was the name that went on all the displays and all over the place, and so it got picked up by all the movies, even though in the early 1900s another scientist looked at the two skeletons and figured those are actually look like they're the same species or the same genus of dinosaur, and the way that naming works is the name that came first is the one that gets to stick. So Brontosaurus became the name that got kicked out, and all Brontosaurus uh, skeletons became Apatosaurus. But the name became popular. It's like Mastodon, which is not the scientific name of anything, but it was almost going to be. Mm -hmm. yep. So Brontosaurus is a name that stuck. And then in 2015, there was another study that came out that said, well, maybe it's a distinct thing also. So, so <laughs> keep in touch with it. <laughs> so right now, Brontosaurus exists. Right. And <laughs> Apatosaurus exists. Okay. Yes. The but, skeletons haven't gone anywhere. Yeah, but we're still figuring out. And then there's the whole, you know, different heads on different things, <laughs> which also oh, well. yeah. screwed up some on that, too. Because they had a, uh, what, what was a brachiosaur head on an apatosaur body? I think, I think. Kamarasaurus. Kamarasaur, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding is that that story has become conflated with the naming story. Has They're it? actually two separate stories. There's a, oh, that uh, makes it even worse. Yeah, there, there, it's, it's that the skull thing was just that we didn't have skulls, so they had to make some skulls up. And sometimes they based it on another dinosaur named Camarasaurus, and other times they just kind of imagined a skull. Let their heart lead them. And, and so later on they had to change them. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not in museums anymore. Good question. Hi. Uh, this close? That's really close. Um, <laughs> question. 
how do you know what dinosaurs sound like if no one was around to hear what they could like purr like a cat or something? Ooh, Ooh how do a, we know what dinosaurs sound like? We that's a really good question. Don't. <laughs> yeah, the, but we, we can make educated guesses from the structure of uh, portions of the skull. Yeah, another big way that we try to study what they could have sounded like, and or more accurately, what noises they might have been able to make, is by looking at modern archosaurs, which is the group dinosaurs belong to, which include birds and crocodilians which are both extremely noisy reptiles. So by studying what part of their body they're using to make the noise and what kind of noise that results in, it might give us an idea of what selection of noises dinosaurs might have been capable of, but we won't actually know until we find soft tissue. Yeah. Based on the archosaur connection, they were probably pretty talkative because the mm -hmm. crocodilians... They're they're more talkative than or as talkative as the frogs. Oh yeah, yes. which oh, is yeah. saying a lot. And I, they could have done it with their mouth closed. So T Rex might have been able to roar without opening its mouth, just by bellowing. Yeah, by, liter by literally uh, uh, vibrating like it, its its throat muscles and just like boom. Yeah, like yeah, really cool. Or yeah. since well, birds are dinosaurs, theropods very bird like. Um, imagine a T Rex possibly like. Singing. Yeah. That is my T Rex headcanon. Yep. Yeah. It's yeah. Singing, chirping, dancing T Rex. Because birds are ridiculous. Like birds of paradise, you know, like the blue one that just yep. goes boom, and it's just like and it and it like bounces back and forth and all that crazy stuff. I want us to find throat pouches. Totally. Yes. The inflatable totally. throat pouches. Yeah. Scientifically, that is more likely than T Rex roaring like a bear. Yes. Or, it's or a very mammal thing to do is to go raw with your mouth open. To make that terrifying noise in Jurassic Park, they uh, like one of the sounds they use is a freight train. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like wild, and then like some like giraffe, weird giraffe, yeah. just a whole, like sixteen or some odd different sounds, and then they ran it all together, and it just made this like. It's just like it wouldn't make that noise. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Hi. Hello. Um, Hi. So my favorite non, or I think non, or my favorite raptor is called the Changi Raptor. Have you heard of it? Is say it again. The Changi Raptor. It's got the four wings. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of wanted to know, uh, what do you guys know about it, and do you know anything about its behavior? Ooh. Oh. So there are a selection of four-winged dromaeosaur dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So picture Velociraptor from Jurassic Park. Uh, shrink it a bunch and cover it in feathers, and you have a dromaeosaur, a real-life dromaeosaur. An actual velociraptor. Yeah. A, an actual velociraptor. Uh, there were a handful of dinosaurs that we now know had feathery wing, basically wing covering on both the front and back legs. And one of them, I don't know much about, I, I know of what has been done with Microraptor, mm -hmm. yeah. which is that, yes, <laughs> Microraptor, uh, which is that they put it in a wind tunnel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they've made models of it. Did they, so did they make a physical model? They of made a project? physical map model of it. Which is better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. Uh, and yeah, at, at least Microraptor looks like it could have glided. Like four individual control surfaces for like micro adjustments and possibility of them because we found multiple Microraptors uh, in singular deposits. They could have hunted in flocks. <laughs> Ooh, hunted bugs. Yeah. yeah they're <laughs> very like, small. They're this really is a very small, small dinosaur. But still, like, think of just, like, a sky full of these tiny little four-winged, like, weird, freaky lizard bird things. It's, like, the greatest way to describe it. But just, like, just, like. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time period through, especially the later part of the Cretaceous period, where you... There would be no line between what is bird and what is bird-like dinosaur. Mm -hmm. It was just a big spectrum. It'd be like today trying to draw a line between, you know, lizards and other lizards. Right. Yeah. Like, what makes an iguana different from a lizard? It's not. That's a, that's a lizard. <laughs> so I have been telling people that Stegosaurus's brains are the size of walnuts because I heard of it. Am I wrong? And B, I heard their brains are abnormally small, and how did that affect their behavior, especially in procreating? Ooh. Interesting. So the question was, is it true that Stegosaurus's brains was the size of walnuts, and how does that affect their behavior? They're a little larger than walnuts. We do have cranial, uh, we do have a, um, 
a, a cranial imprint from stegosaurs. They're a little bit bigger than walnuts, maybe like a few walnuts together. Have they done an <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they've done an endocast okay. of, of stegosaurs. Um, nice. Weirdly nice. enough, like brain size compared to body, it, it gets weird. I'm not a neurologist. I am, I'm not a, an animal behaviorist, but there are plenty of really tiny animals that have complex courtship rituals and procreation ideas and oh i mean just think of mice Mm -hmm. and like mice have communication and their brains are really tiny really tiny even for their body size so uh the whole like oh it has a tiny brain Mm -hmm. it's dumb maybe like kind of false which is interesting to connect it to an animal we already talked about, uh, modern archosaurs, crocodilians. Oh, yeah. Uh, crocodilian. So an alligator's brain is about the size of my thumb. Yeah. Uh, that's the entire brain for most crocodiles. A big crocodile might be a really big thumb. But they're not very large, but yet they are highly communicative. They, they are very uh, uh, loud talkers. They have mating displays and courtship. They also can recognize and learn training. And an alligator's tool use, using sticks to lure in birds as prey, has been found. So if you can do all of that with something, with a thumb, uh, two walnuts is plenty. <laughs> they predict the tides. They can predict the tides a year apart. Absolutely. To figure out when the best fishing opportunities are. And that's something we, we still don't know how they do this. Cool. The big problem that Segasaurs would have when it comes to procreating is how do you get around all those spikes? And we don't have to talk about that now, but I will tell you to go find a book called All Yesterdays. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. All, All Yesterdays. Yesterdays. If you forget it before the end, come up and ask us. We'll write it down for you. Absolutely. Okay. Is it true? Is it true that all dino- that today's birds are the direct descendants of dinosaurs today? Uh, yes. It's yeah. It's well. <laughs> yep. It's more than that. They're not even direct descendants. Birds are dinosaurs. Yeah. They're the living. They're living dinosaurs. They're Birds are dinosaurs the same way bats are mammals, the same way that butterflies are insects. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They are one branch of that big family tree. And so please cook your dinosaur to 165 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> Hi. Um, so when we found out that uh, dinosaurs, we were like, yeah, a lot of them have feathers on like Jurassic Park. Like that was cool. I've accepted it since then. <laughs> but um, feathers are scary. As far as the coloring, is there anything like in like fossil records and stuff that tells you and informs you what colors they are? I, we should go to the illustrator. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say, Karen. <laughs> yeah, um, Anchiornis is the. I think that was the first one that they determined the color patterns exactly. on, and it had this beautiful shade of uh, almost terracotta red and black and white plumage in addition to that. And it was it's a really, really lovely animal. And they do this by analyzing, they do chemical analysis on the feathers to determine the chemical signatures of the pigments. There used to be an app um, called Chemical Ghosts that uh, I don't know if it's still available, but it, it detailed the layering process um, to that would determine the colors. Uh, is really fascinating to look at. Um, we also have found iridescence in feathers of dinosaurs. Microraptor was one of the first that we found iridescence in. So you, you look at uh, uh, a grackle or a starling, for instance, and they have that oil slick kind of reflective property to it. Microraptor would have been covered in feathers like that. Yeah, this is one of my favorite things uh, that we've discovered in recent years in paleontology because if you went back... 50 years and said, hey, someday we'll figure out what color these were, they'd all laugh at you because that just that was so out of the realm of what we thought was possible. And now we've actually been identifying it fairly regularly with a number of really good specimens, and that's so cool. I love it. We're even, um, there's also an example of non-feathered skin pigmentation. So there was this really cool dinosaur. They called it the quote-unquote mummified hadrosaur, Leonardo. Oh. Yeah. Um, it wasn't really mummified. That's a misnomer. It was it was a fossil, but the it, the fossilization was so complete that not only were there organs, but there was this large swath of a skin imprint and the skin itself. Looking at it, it had black and white bands. It was zebraed going down its tail. This is a hadrosaur, a duck-billed dinosaur, 
that had black and white bands like a California king snake, like a zebra <laughs> going down its tail. And you can infer that those kind of patterns are generally used, vertical stripes like that are used in uh, for camouflage in larger wooded areas because, uh, quick thing, I'm also a herpetologist, California king snakes have two different kind of banding. You've got the bands, and then you've got the long ones. Uh, they, they're striped instead of banded. The striped ones are moving constantly, so the shadows are longer in the deserts and the areas that they go in. The striped ones, they curl at the base of bushes, and the shadows coming through the branches have stripes. So these animals were walking through larger plant material that was breaking up their pattern. It's just simple coloration. It's protective coloration. It's so rad. <laughs> it's They've done recent studies on uh, patterning on zebras yeah. uh, as well and have determined that it's actually uh, a deterrent to insects, yeah. which would have definitely been an issue for these hadrosaurs as big as they were and as, as large a group as they traveled in. So dinosaurs were colorful and noisy like birds. Yeah. It's the kind of yeah. points that really all these new discoveries are pointing us to. So much fun. <laughs> Um, I want to become a paleontologist when I grow up, and my question is, um, I want to know what life is like every day at the campsite where you dig at paleontology Ooh. so I can make my decision, and when I grow older, um, I can know what it's like. <laughs> That's a an bit. excellent That's a question. question. Excellent. That is such a rad question. Oh, my. So, first and foremost, if you want to be a paleontologist... Do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Keep asking questions like that, and you will keep getting the answers that will help you get to becoming a paleontologist. Do you like That's to get awesome. dirty? <laughs> a little a little bit. Okay. okay. You don't have to get dirty to be a paleontologist. True. You. She did ask what it's like out in the field, though. Yeah, she did. Well, Will and I are mostly a bad pair to ask this question to. We're spoiled. <laughs> because the fossil site we work at is in the backyard of the museum, which is two minutes off the highway. I mean, it's a whole, like, 40-foot trek from the bathroom. It's real <laughs> hot out there, though. <laughs> like, sometimes, uh, like, lunch doesn't come as soon as you want it to. Well, and if the sun angles wrong under the pavilion. TJ only brings cookies on Fridays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it, it can be really brutal. <laughs> How's your digging experience? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at the tar pits, when I, uh, when I was a lab supervisor there, it was kind of the same thing. It was, it was uh, a real quick walk out, uh, out to the pits. Um, we had fans pointing down into pit 91 uh, when I was working in the lab because, again, being a paleontologist doesn't mean you're always out in the field because you have to bring all that stuff you find back into a lab and work on it. But if you want to get into dinosaur paleontology dinosaurs are found a lot of them are in places like montana and utah new mexico arizona where it's hot they're in places known as badlands <laughs> and it's a long drive out there a longer drive to the site you are working in very hot uh, very hot conditions for very long hours um, it can be dangerous because you have to make sure you're drinking plenty of water. You're hiking correctly. We have bugs. There's it, it can be really, really dirty and really, really sweaty, and you can get really, really angry at what's going on <laughs> and your fellow paleontologists. <laughs> but it all goes away the moment you're hiking or you're sweeping something, and then literally there's just this thumb-sized fragment of bone coming out of the ground. You're like, oh, cool, what's that? And then you start sweeping it, and you realize it's the tip of a ceratopsian horn, or like a relative of a triceratops. And then you keep sweeping, and then you realize after a couple days of chiseling and hammering and sweeping that you have an entire dinosaur skull, and you are the first human, the first bipedal mammal <laughs> you're the first thing in 66 million years to look at that bone that is where paleontology goes really cool and you just kind of sit back and go 
dude. <laughs> and then you have to go, this thing weighs 550 pounds. <laughs> Somebody get a lot of plaster. Yeah. And a helicopter. And a helicopter. Yes. <laughs> or in the case of the uh, uh, Utah Ceratops on Horse Mountain, uh, we had to slide it down the hill on a car hood with seven <laughs> of us on ropes. It's not glamorous. We need it's, to get a car hood. Yeah, it's, yeah a, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of swearing. It's a lot of cursing. It's a lot of sweating. It's a lot of, I'm never going to do this again. And then you get back to the lab, and you're like, I found a triceratops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, but the most important thing is, it's really fun. Yeah. People will tell you about the hard conditions out in the field. They'll tell you about the bugs and the, the, the heat. Um, and they'll get through all of that, and then they will tell you it was one of the coolest experiences of their life. And this is something I hear consistently from people coming back from the field. Yeah. yeah. And if you want, uh, if you ever have any other questions about being a paleontologist, that this goes for anybody in the room, there are four Twitter handles up here, and there are tons of friendly paleontologists out there. Reach out. We will put you in touch with people who can help you find stuff. Nationwide, internationally. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Name a country. We've got, we probably can find yes. somebody in it. <laughs> yep. And they're all awesome. Yeah. <laughs> On land and then the oceans, which were the two top apex predators that all the other dinos ran or swam from? <laughs> Which oh. were the top eight? That's Depen going to depend on where in the world you are and, and what when. and what time period it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow! I mean, T Rex is famously, you know, the biggest thing around in certain parts of North America at the very end of the Cretaceous. But in but, Mongolia, you had the T Rex cousins like uh, Tyrannosaurus batar. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Giganotosaurus in uh, South America. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in a lot of cases, there would not have been a, a single answer because while I'm running from T-Rex, everything in South America has no idea what a T-Rex is and is running from something different. And also, though, these are the big famous predators, and grizzly bears are not what kill most of the things out west. Wolves are. Mm -hmm. Like Wolves are much more active predators than the bears. The bears chase off the wolves from their kills a lot of the time, but... Just because you're the biggest predator doesn't mean you're the one doing the most predating. And so that's a, that's a case where if you ask the dinosaurs, they might say, Deinonychus. Deinonychus is the worst. I said that for him. Oh, yeah. Who cheered for Deinonychus? <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Now, see, if you were in South America, I would throw a whole monkey wrench into that, and all the dinosaurs would be afraid of Dinosuchus. Yes, oh, they yeah. would. Yeah, and they'd be correct. <laughs> yep. Dinosaur-eating crocodilian. Huge yes. like, crocodilian. Like, I'm so into him, I have a tattoo of one. Yes. Oh, and, yeah, that's, that's awesome. No, look at, see, it even wow. has the, None of you can see this, but it's real cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's cool. So, uh, there, yeah, it, it, even, it even has the, uh, the, the nose bulb. Yes. Yeah. We'll pass Trevor around later, and you can all see <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Ew. As I peel it off. No, yeah, but then you had Dinosuchus. But when you're in the water... Um, where there were no dinosaurs. By the way, we just, I have to, I have to yes, do that. Yes, yes, please. Dinosaurs were terrestrial. So a T Rex, dinosaur. Stegosaurs, dinosaur. Mosasaur, not a dinosaur. It was a marine reptile. Pterodactyls or pterosaurs were flying reptiles. Dinosaur is a very specific term. It is either a bipedal or quadrupedal land reptile with its legs directly underneath its body. Spinosaurs. Spinosaurs were also dinosaurs, and they are not aquatic. That is... Semi-aquatic at sem best. At best. Yes. Probably the most aquatic dinosaurs we know about are penguins. Yes. Yes. And the like. But started terrestrial. Mm. Adapted yes, to water. And still okay on land. Still yeah. semi-aquatic. Yeah, perfectly fine. Now, the same thing for the aquatic reptiles is going to go as for the dinosaurs. That's going to depend on when, you are, when and where you are. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the Triassic or early Jurassic, ichthyosaurs, the, yeah. the, 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 yeah. the dolphin-shaped ones, are going to be the big deal. But if you're in the late Cretaceous, uh, lizards have taken over the seas, and you get mosasaurs, mm -hmm. which are your big sort of sea serpent-looking creatures. The be all the best stuff was in the late Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mos <Yeah>. the best <laughs> Mosasaurus, Lypleridon, uh, Tylosaurus, 
all those really, really terrifying ones. But then you get monster sharks. Yes. You also get monster sharks. When you, when you get Megs later on. Yeah. Yes. After the dinosaurs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Most of the dinosaurs. Because paleontology is not always just dinosaurs. Yes. Mammoths <laughs> are cool. <laughs> yes, they are. Hi. Um, so it's on my bucket list to uh, actually go out and dig up dinosaur bones on a vacation for fun. I've always wanted to do this. Where's the best place to do it, and what should I bring with me? Mm. Ooh. Good what question. Tools? That's well, all you, I, you'll know the legalities on that. That's the thing, the legalities of it. So the, the question was, you know, bucket list, want to find a dinosaur. How do I do it? What do I bring? The best thing you can possibly do is find a local natural history museum mm -hmm. and volunteer with them, and they will take you out. It happens a lot. A lot of people don't realize that. But like uh, NHM in Los Angeles, NHM in New York, the ROM in Toronto, uh, Alberta. Um, Denver. Denver. I oh, volunteered yeah. with the Denver dig once. Um, uh, a whole lot of the Burke, uh, Cleveland um, with Lee. University yep. of Florida. The University looking, of Florida. They're looking for people right now. All of these places. In, literally, it's like I've always wanted to do that. And I want to go and you will go out with a group and you'll spend six weeks hanging out in kind of bad conditions, <laughs> um, digging stuff up. And it's a lot of fun. What you need to bring are layers, mm -hmm. lots and lots of layers, because you will be working up a sweat and you will want to take off the, the flannel and then the T-shirt and get down to, you know, just like the tank top and the shorts and try and get all that. But you need shade at the same time if you don't have a pop-up tent and it, it, clothing and water. The tools will be provided <laughs> clothing and water as much as you can carry. So I have uh, three questions. Go small. Just one question. Okay. One, right. please. Ah, uh, let's see. One I most want to know then. Okay. I was reading a uh, recent study that stated that Triceratops may not have been its own thing, but actually a juvenile version of a two-horned variant. Uh, how <laughs> accurate is this? So, there has been a lot of discussion in dinosaur circles about uh, telling the difference between different species and different stages of life in the same species. It was only right once. <laughs> and so far, uh, one is generally accepted. Yeah, one is one is generally accepted. So, has anybody heard of the Hogwarts dinosaur, Draco Draco Rex, Draco -Rex Hogwartsia. Hogwartsia? Um, Hogwartsia. Thank you. Also, if you've seen um, Jurassic World: Fallen Kingdom, raise your hand if you've seen Jurassic World: Fallen Kingdom. Awesome. I'm sorry, but also the little mm -hmm. Stiggy Moloch that's running around with the the. The battering ram head and the spikes, that's yeah. very much what we're talking about. Yeah, it so might had, actually be exactly what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, you have Dracorex, you have Stigmalock, and then you have Pachycephalosaurus. Uh, turns out that when they're young, they're spiky. And then their cranium starts to swell, and then they start to get a dome. And then the dome is that weird-looking Pachycephalosaurus, the head butters, that basically have the fryer tuck, where it's a big bald spot and little spikes all around the back. So it turns out... Yeah, yes. yeah. Stig <laughs> Stigma lock is the edgy teenage phase of so you've got little kids, which were the uh, which were the Dracorex, Stigma lock, and then Pachycephalosaurus. That that worked because you can tell how young an animal is because craniums fuse, the bone limb bones fuse. It there you have to be able to grow. If all bones were all stuck together, if like the ends of your femurs were already adhered to the shaft of your femur when you were born, your leg couldn't grow. As the shaft grows and as the ends grow, then they fuse later in life when you need a full weight-bearing limb. So dinosaurs are the same way. So yes, there was one example <laughs> that multiple different former species are more likely than not all the same. They are all different, uh, different age classifications of Pachycephalosaurus. That does not necessarily mean that Nanotyrannus is a juvenile Tyrannosaur or that Triceratops is a juvenile Taurosaurus because we have found baby trikes, middle-aged trikes, and elder trikes, and we have found Taurosaurs of various sizes. 
So that right there is kind of like they're not really related. They're well, they're they're cousins, but it's not the same growth pattern. And the one paleontologist that has come up with all three of these, <laughs> he was right once. <laughs> But it needs to stop. Because <laughs> everything isn't everything. And if you'll remember our Brontosaurus discussion, even if that did turn out to be true, it would still be Triceratops because the name Triceratops came first. Yes. I've drawn all three of those uh, Pachycephalosaur um, iterations. And one of the ways you get to know an extinct animal really, really well is by, by drawing it. And there, if you draw it enough, you start feeling whether there is a sameness, and you really feel when there's a difference. And now, as an illustrator, I can have my opinions on this until the cows come home, <laughs> but, you know, my opinion in the end doesn't really matter. My job is to get, get it recorded accurately, and I can leave the determinations to these folks. But... I do have opinions. <laughs> <laughs> so at the beginning of the panel, you mentioned um, prehistoric non-dinosaurs. And I'm just curious, in your opinions, what are the most underrated non-dinosaur prehistoric animals? <laughs> and the rest of the panel was... <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. The non-dinosaurs? Yeah, yeah. Like, what, what's your most underrated non-dinosaur? Prehistoric oh. creature. Prehistoric creature. Now, like, and, wow. like, just to be clear, prehistoric creature basically starts, so, the end of the last ice age, where the place, the Pleistocene ended, was around 11,500 years ago. So that means from 11,500 years ago, all the way back. So there's a lot of cool I'm I had to mute a... myself because I was about to swear, and this is a clean panel for a clean podcast. I'm working on a project right now uh, on fossil horses, and um, the more that I work with these different species, the more uh, really mesmerized with their, their builds and the different body styles I become. Uh, basically, what horses were doing in North America are what we see in antelope in Africa today. So you think about all the different body shapes and horn configurations and uh, differences in coloration, size, uh, ability to run the places that they live, whether or not they can swim. That was the variety of horses that we had here in North America, which is just mind-blowing to consider because the horse that we know now is pretty much the same from place to place to place. I got to go with all the other big cats because everybody knows saber tooth cat. And it's saber tooth cat, not tiger. <laughs> it's saber tooth cat. Um, but like Pantera Aatrox. Ooh. Yes. The American <laughs> lion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Size of a Siberian tiger. Ran really fast. Big kitty. Half a ton of angry cat. <laughs> awesome. But then you've got like the Dirk Toot cats and like Barbaro Felis and all these really weird ones that have like chin flares and all the, uh, just like there's so many rad cats that are out there that are like it, Smilodon. I mean, yeah, I have a tattoo of a Smilodon, like well, a few of them. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's like it's California state fossil and all of that, but it's always like. Everyone's always like saber tooth cat. It's like when I was working at the tar pits, I was there for six years and I was doing tours and I was talking to people. This one oh God, it was so cool. This one girl came up to the lab and tapped on the window. What you're not supposed to do. Please don't tap on the glass. <laughs> um, the scientists in there get twitchy. <laughs> and she started pointing really excitedly at the, at the mount of the saber tooth cat, but on the other side of the saber tooth cat, there was a Panthera atrox, a, a North American lion. So I like take the lab coat off. I come out and I'm like, yeah, what would you like to know about the saber tooth cat? She's like, no, 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 no. My favorite cat of all time is the American lion. I'm like, I am talking to you for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> yes. Tell me everything you know. 
Yes. Let's. Do you want to come into the lab? Because I'm cleaning the claw of one right now. <laughs> and yeah, I just I like that. It's the cats are on. I'm a. I'm also a cat guy. <laughs> well, they're cool. Mm-hmm. They're very cool. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I have professionally obligated to answer this question. And now I I will I, I can expand it mm-hmm. and just say squamates in general. Mm-hmm. Mm. S- the order squamata is your lizards and snakes. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, <laughs> back there. And that's, yes, right up here. That's my my whole jam is snakes and lizards. Mosasaurs, like I said, the giants are lizards that evolved convergently with whales, which is just absolutely super cool. Snakes are everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like, you go go to a fossil site, unless it's like a reef, and depending on what time period it is, maybe even then, mm. They're a snake. They're everywhere. Snakes are just this the, the coolest animals to me because they went ahead and evolutionarily did a thing that seems totally ridiculous. And that So when, when fish moved onto land, they gave rise to a group of animals called tetrapods. And tetrapod means four feet. And that became all of your amphibians, uh, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Four feet. And snakes are one of a few groups of animals that went ahead and went, you know what? Nah. <laughs> and you would think, because you look at all this tetrapod diversity, and the, like primates are swinging in trees, and moles are digging, and, and dolphins are swimming in the ocean, and snakes have done all of that. Oh, there are burrowing snakes. There are snakes that hop across the sand. There are snakes that glide. How cool is that? No legs. <laughs> no legs. There are like 24 or something different times that lizards have lost their legs, but only one time did they then go on to completely take over the world. And in the fossil record, you can watch when mm-hmm. different groups, there's like three major phases of sea snakes, mm. different groups of snakes that took over shallow oceans. Mm. And then like when grasslands pop up and take over the world way after the dinosaur peri- uh, uh, age of dinosaurs ended, the snake regime changes. And suddenly you have vipers <laughs> and all sorts of cool fast snakes like we have today. And it's just such a cool story, and it doesn't get talked about much because the snake fossil record is limited to vertebrae backbones almost entirely, which makes them a huge pain in the neck to study. Mm-hmm. Nah. Yeah. But hey, how I'm, many here, people, I'm here all panel. How many people here know the animal Titanoboa? <laughs> yeah, okay, I yeah, know you, you kind of went on the snakes there. But. <laughs> oh, yeah, Dinosaur eating snake. <laughs> well, well, I mean, could have. Yeah. <laughs> Titanoboa is a snake that lived uh, about 60 million years ago in Colombia, so sh- just a few million years after the big dinosaur extinction. And it, the latest estimate that I read, I was actually at the SVP when they announced it. Yeah. It was very funny because Jason Head and his team announced Titanoboa, and it was the last, second to last talk of the session. And they went up there and they're like, we discovered this snake. Our estimates have it at like 46 feet long. Which is so it would have been they they reconstructed a lot like an anaconda, real big, living in you know fresh water, lots of big fish in that fossil mm-hmm. deposit, so probably a fish eater. And then the next talk, the last talk of the session was another guy I know, and I won't say his name uh, to emba- uh, embarrass him. And he went up and he said, "Well, I'm going to present on what I thought was the biggest snake <laughs> <laughs> until 15 minutes ago." <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. was very mean on the part of the people who organized that panel. Snake anatomy is really weird. They've got these transverse processes that come off their uh, off their spinal uh, their vertebra off the spinal columns. Um, so see, you, you know the double doors you walked in. Tit- Titanoboa's transverse processes wouldn't be able to get through the door. <laughs> yeah, it was really wide too. Big snake. Big snake. Hey, Will, you haven't gotten an answer to this question. Well, to stay on brand. <laughs> I will pick a type of croc, but I can't say crocs in general because crocs actually are very well represented in the popularity. But herbivorous crocodilomorphs are not usually. Oh, dude, you're going this route. Mm-hmm. That is one of my favorites. So crocodilomorphs are the overall group that include modern-day crocodiles, alligators, caimans, the crocodilians. They've had ancestors going back to the beginning of the dinosaurs mm-hmm. and – They've had all sorts of crazy forms. There's been marine varieties, which also don't get talked about enough. But they've had tons of terrestrial varieties, running and galloping croc cousins. 
some of them decided to start eating plants and have gotten rid of all of their sharp teeth and get, gotten these nipping, shredding teeth. And I love those. Simosuchus is my favorite because it's about the size of a, a small Labrador retriever and was covered in armor like an armadillo. So it would have been adorable, <laughs> and I want one as a pet. <laughs> but the reason this is so important to me is because there is this – there's this really bad continued mentality of living fossils, that there are these animals on the planet today that have just been sticking around and just have never clicked that update button every time it's come up and have just stayed the same for millions of years. And that's almost never actually true. Like, almost every example they give of that, no, it is different. It may be very similar, but it is different. Yeah, the same coelacanths have not been hanging no. around. The same crocodiles, the same snakes. No. no it's it, like they're, they're related. Absolutely. And crocs drive me the craziest because there's this mentality because of things like, which I love, Dinosuchus is amazing. This 40-foot croc that lived with the dinosaurs and looks like a giant croc. It was actually closer related to alligators mm -hmm. than crocs. But because of stuff like that, and because there's been lots that have been shaped that way over time, because it's a really good way to hunt in rivers, people are like, oh, they've been the same since the time of the dinosaurs, completely skipping over the ones that ran on land and had serrated teeth, or the ones who switched over to plants or grew flippers that would go out into the ocean. So I like the herbivorous ones, because they really break the croc mold, and we need to respect that. <laughs> good question. Um, I recently read an article... Um, I recently read an article that uh, left me wanting more about a notosaurus that had recently been found with intact skin and organs, and I was hoping was you could tell me more about that. So the, the question was a notosaur that had been, was preserved with intact skin, and you said organs. Yeah, I know oh, of. Yeah, is that, yeah, that's dinosaur. That's, that's Zool. Okay, yeah. go right ahead. <laughs> you were like, that's Zool. I'm like, yeah. And then I, I had to process, uh, I think yeah. It was Andrea Atchin that uh, actually did the reconstruction on it. Um, I have not seen the the remains. I would love to. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't seen the, them either. The I've, I've only read the paper. Just the material that's available for, for paleo artists, there were several that jumped on it immediately. And uh, just the information we have about this animal's appearance based on that is phenomenal. I don't think we, we have something that's even more complete um, but the, the, for, for reconstruction purposes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's stuff like that, like Leonardo, the mummified hadrosaur, and Dinozool, and uh, all of that. It's really changing how we work in the field because we're starting to realize that when, when the animal dies, and in the case of, of Dinozool, um, it, was, uh, it was a tr what we call a uh, transport fossil, so it was it died in water, but what happened is that the body bloated, and then when bodies bloat, they flip over, and then that bursts in a really gross way, and it sank down into this really, really, really fine mud that happened to be anaerobic. There was no bacteria in it; it was just this super fine clay-like silt, and the body settles in it. And then it slowly mineralizes. It was the perfect conditions. That's starting to tell us that we need to look really close at a lot of things. Because before, I, I hate to say it and I will happily even admit it myself, we just kind of tunnel through stuff. We're just like, oh, okay, here's a bone. Start chiseling. Get the overburden off. Get the backhoe. You know, that kind of deal. Now these kinds of, these really touchy preservations are teaching us that we have to go really slow. We have to double check because is it fine clay like Lagerstatten that you get all the Archaeopteryx out of and you get, you get uh, feather imprints? Mm -hmm. Is it things like Zool or Leonardo that are, you know, quote unquote mummified dinosaurs? It's changing the way we do field work and changing the way that we there, – there used to be a rush of got to find the next bone, got to get this out there, got to get it to a museum, got to name it, got to do the research. It's – we're slowing down now, which is nice yeah. because you've got – like you've got some of your uh, uh, preservation at the Gray site that's just freaky. Yeah. 
It's nice. It's so nice. <laughs> and, you know, finding, like, literally frozen animals in the permafrost. And it's, yeah, we're, we're slowing down, um, which is really cool. Yeah. And the, I, I like those kind of sites because it's, it, it slows us down. It, it, mm -hmm. it takes our time, and we're, we're respecting the animals more, which has always been really important to me. And for anyone who's not familiar with Zool or Notosaurs, Notosaurs are cousins of the Ankylosaurs, so the armored, some of them club-tailed dinosaurs. Oh, right, yeah. We didn't even say what a <laughs> Notosaurs tank was. dinosaurs. Yeah. This one actually preserved all that external armor in 3D, the shape it was on the body, which is part of the reason that us paleontologists are freaking out about it because it's actually kept the overall shape of the entire corpse. And, yes, it is named after Zool from Ghostbusters because of the spikes <laughs> on the head. So, yes, that's the name. It kind of looks like the devil dog. Yep. Its full name, I can't remember the species name off the top of my head, but it, the translation is Zool the Destroyer of Shins. Yes. Yep. <laughs> that was Arbor, was that Arbor and Evans? Who did that? I think that was Victoria Arbor and I, David I Evans. I think it was. Because they're I, awesome. I know it was. I know. I think it was Victoria. I'm pretty sure it was David. I just wanted to correctly attribute the artist I mentioned earlier who did the really cool uh, reconstruction of Zool, Andre Atuchin. And cool. you can find them on Twitter, Andre Atuchin. Nice. We've talked a lot about dinosaurs. Can I ask a question about ancient plant life? Uh oh, go right. We will do our best. We'll you try. Nothing you can ask. I'm just looking for some cool facts. What do you like about them? What makes them way cooler than modern plants? Oh boy. Oh. My favorite thing about plants, and I hinted at it before, is that up until the very, very end of the age of dinosaurs, grass wasn't really a thing. Mm -hmm. And it took another like 30 million years before grasslands evolved. So you. Ha you Grassland, T-Rex never saw a grassland. Most life on Earth has never seen a grassland. And once grass kind of hit on that, taking over an ecosystem lifestyle, grassland, you hit the, like, the early Miocene, so you're about like 30 million years ago or so, and then you just start seeing grasslands take over every continent on the planet. And now we have biomes that didn't used to exist. Yes. Grasslands are a biome that showed up like 30 million years ago. Tons of our animals today, like Karen was mentioning, the evolution of horses. S horses are incredibly closely tied to grasslands. A lot of our tall, hoofed animals are tied to grasslands. The same thing can be said about... I mean, there are also biomes that we've lost. So there is a, a type of biome called the mammoth steppe. Oh, yeah. Which I know Trevor uh, knows about. This oh, is yeah. a northern cold grassland environment by a whole biome, a whole ecosystem that was controlled in part by the movement of nutrients and the shaping of the environment of mammoths and stuff. And that is a biome that does not exist anymore. It's overtaken by grassland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're used to, in the, the, the certain parts of the age of dinosaurs, you had polar forests. Mm -hmm. Polar forests, because there wasn't permanent ice up at the, at the caps. So you had a forest that was in the darkness for six months of the year. How do you do that? <laughs> so there are entire like forms of continental environment that just don't exist anymore because of the way that plants and animals have changed. Hi. I, um, yeah, like really get on the mic. Right up here. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> So my question is, we look at everything through the evolution. So through what evolutionary advantages, processes, T-Rex has such tiny hands? <laughs> <laughs> I love this question. It's so good. So the question is, what is with T-Rex and its tiny hands? Why would our natural selection allow such a thing? Well, I mean, when you can literally bite a cow in half, you don't need hands. Yeah. And the like, thing I... literally bite a cow in half. We're we're talking like oh what was uh, what was John's latest figures on it? It's like fifteen thousand pounds of pressure. That sounds right. Yeah, uh, like per square inch. That's fifteen thousand pounds on a quarter. And these teeth are naturally much larger diameter than a quarter. But all of that on those tiny little points on that teeth, it's biting through things or biting, locking in, and just kind of going wrench. <laughs> you you don't need. 
little you don't need hands when it comes to that. <laughs> yeah, it, right. This yeah. Is, I actually made that uh so I have two quick comments. One is I actually there was a study that came out recently that I think suggested, I don't remember how uh, it was a suggestion that it may have been that the arm shrinking left more muscle space for the jaws. Mm-hmm. That if you're you're losing a lot of the you're you're gaining a lot more muscle attachment space. And then I hear people ask a lot, you know, what, how do you, how can you be an effective hunter without arms? And I'm like, well, snakes don't use their arms, and crocs don't use their arms. Nope. Sharks. And sharks don't use their arms. Yeah. Most birds. Starfish. Yeah. Well, okay. Actually. <laughs> but snails. Snails are a better example. <laughs> well, and uh, another point I always like to compare when it. T-Rex comes up is because that's the famous one yeah. for having puny arms. But there were lots of dinosaurs that yes. had puny Carnotaur. arms. Yes. Carnotaurs. Carnotaurs. <laughs> Some people have argued whether or not those even made it all the way out of the muscle wall yeah. because they're so puny. There was one, di- I can't remember the name right now, that had reduced down to a single claw. Mononychus. Mononychus, yeah. thank you. And so it, it's also a weight thing. If you're standing on two legs but you're standing with your body sideways, on, you know, instead of straight up and down like ours, you're a pivot. So you have your legs as the pivot, and your tail and your front of the body are the two weights. If you want more neck and more head, you need to start reducing something, and the rest of the organs are more important than the arms. So you start reducing those arms, and then you can just do as much with that face as you want to. Yeah, but those arms weren't small slouches. Like, actually studying the muscle attachment points, the bicep alone on a a full-size T-Rex, like Sue at the Field Museum, it could curl 650 pounds. So it was perfectly capable of falling asleep on its stomach, kind of like head out, little tiny arms underneath it, then it would just kind of like crank up its backside and give a push. (laughs) And you'd have a nine-ton animal going, all right, I'm up, (laughs) with those tiny little arms. You know, big hen, tiny arm. That, meet the Robinsons. It's yes. one of my favorite it's scenes. Fantastic. It's like, I don't think this big hen, well tiny out. arms. And it's yes. like, yes. yes. <laughs> because it couldn't talk either, because we're not sure how it vocalizes. No. <laughs> so you're saying it could have talked like a parrot. Maybe. <laughs> uh, going uh, away from prehistoric reptiles, what do you think of some of the new prehistoric insects like. Uh, Buratina truncata and the uh, its related species that were just brought up a few days before Dragon Con. Pretty exciting. Yeah, what, what do you think re- about that? Haven't read the paper yet. Now we're on. Now we're being quizzed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> haven't read the paper yet, but wow, were there trippy insects? Um, I mean, it, talk about underrated. Yeah. I mean. Yes. I mean to be. I mean, they it, still are. They still are. Yes. I mean, it all started with you know Truth. stuff with uh, exoskeletons, and then we had fish. And all that, but while all that was going on, you have dragonflies with six foot wingspans and millipedes that, if it would co- walk into the room, it would be from one end of the table to the other. You know, these big, massive, gnarly things and sea scorpions mm-hmm. and, and just like basically, it, oh, really cool stuff. And they've been doing what's fascinating about insects is how early on they hit on the stuff that they're still doing today. Yep. Like, we, f- flight has been achieved four times. Every, well, five if you count cheating and building airplanes. Yes. But four yeah. groups of animals have evolved flight. And vertebrates did it three times. Pterosaurs, birds, and bats in that order. And pterosaurs had pulled it off by about well, 200 million years ago or so. Insects managed it at least 100 million years before that. We have uh, uh, amber is a great source of knowledge about insects and other bugs. There's amber-preserved spider web mm-hmm. with s- other bugs stuck in it. Like, insects and other uh, uh, creepy crawlies found these super awesome strategies way back when and have just continued with these winning strategies ever since. And they survived five major extinctions. Oh, absolutely. They sure did. Well, and <laughs> the, the way I like to think of it is if, if a less biased uh, uh, per, you know, group were the one examining Earth. You know, if an alien race and not a bunch of mammals were the ones examining the history of Earth, they'd say that it was a planet of arthropods. Yeah. You know, we have the age of the dinosaurs and the age of the fish and the age of the mammals, but arthropods have been ruling all of those times the entire time. And they still are. They still outnumber us, and they're still everywhere. So, like, we, we like to harp on all these big 
you know, bony animals and skeletal animals, but the arthropods have been maintaining half our ecosystems since the beginning, which mm -hmm. is, yeah, they get totally underrated. Totally. Even in this panel of vertebrate specialists. Right. <laughs> who don't know the insect. That oh, yeah, I'm not yeah. studying them. <laughs> <laughs> They're really hard to study. They are. Okay. Go ahead. So we know that like raptors and stuff had feathers, but did other kinds of dinosaurs have feathers? So the question is, for anyone who didn't hear it, uh, basically how widespread are feathers in dinosaurs? Did others besides Velociraptor and friends? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are feathers. So there is a huge swath of the of the theropod family tree, the big, the two, well, not always big, but two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs. There are feathered dromaeosaurs, so your velociraptor and stuff. There are feathers known from ornithomimids. So you remember the scene in Jurassic Park with the gala gala mimus <laughs> when they're flocking this way? They're, that they're group of dinosaurs like had feathers. <laughs> uh, Troodon and friends had feathers. There are feathered tyrannosaurs. Yep. We haven't had T Rex with feathers because nope. they tend not to be fossilized in the kinds of environments that preserve feathers. But T Rex cousins, early tyrannosaur cousins, we have found them with feathers. Mm -hmm. Exactly how widespread feathers were is kind of an open question. We, the, there, there's a ceratopsian with feathers. Yes. Yeah, so Psittacosaurus has yeah. something that is either feathers or very much like feathers. And if it's the same evolutionary origin as feathers, then that would push the first evolution of feathers to the very base of the dinosaur family tree, which would suggest that feathers are a feature we should expect on all dinosaurs, except the ones who have lost them. Yeah. There are also maybe feathers on pterosaurs. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then feathers predate dinosaurs. Uh, yeah. Because, yeah, feathers are, feathers are not just like, uh, like you know, you stick in your hat, covering a bird today. There's, there's different forms of feathers. You have proto feathers. You've got small little fibrous, like, fuzz. There's all this kind of stuff. And, oh, what is it? Is it, um, ah, it was in Jura it was in Jurassic World, the first one. Uh, one of the uh, one of the pterosaurs. Uh, Dimorphodon. Yeah, Dimorphodon. Di they that I was so proud of them for actually giving a proper look to it. Dimorphodon has been found with imprints of this weird little feathery like fur on its back, mm -hmm. like on its torso, like it had a little fur vest going on, <laughs> but feathery. Which is rad, because that is a pterosaur. That is a flying, tailed reptile with, like, proto-feathery fuzz. That's trippy. <laughs> yeah, so keep an eye on China. Yep. Yeah. Because that's where all the cool feathered that's dinosaurs are coming out That's all the cool stuff of. comes out of. Cool. Um, let everyone know we're approaching the, the hour mark. However, this is the last panel in the room, so we'll keep going with questions. Just wanted to let you know the time. We will sit here all night. However long. Well, I, I, I do have the Cybertron Spree to see. Will and I will sit here all <laughs> night. <laughs> How do um, dinosaurs evolve to birds? Ooh. Very good question. Very good question. So there's, there's a couple of big ideas on exactly how that happened. And so basically, we have fo fossils of dinosaurs that we know had feathery arms. So they already had kind of wings. They might not have been flying with them. They may not have even been gliding with them. And what they were using that for, people are still trying to figure out. They may have used it to uh, protect themselves, you know, to keep themselves warm. They may have used them to signal to one another. They could have used them to show off, like birds use by flashing their feathers, uh, which is, I, that is my favorite thing to think about dinosaurs doing, is big flashy displays. So we know there were feathery kind of winged dinosaurs, and the two ideas are that either some of them started climbing trees and were hunting for stuff in the trees, and then when they jump, would use those feathers to glide or parachute down to not fall and break a leg. Or that as they chase stuff, they use those feathers to either help them jump better or stabilize themselves while they ran so that they didn't fall over to catch bugs. And eventually, using one of those two techniques, they started moving those arms, and that became flapping, and they started flying, which started them down the line toward birds. Which one it is is hard to say. There's evidence for both, though uh, we do have videos of like baby birds using their wings to help them climb steep surfaces by flapping their not yet fully formed wings. 
So, yeah. yeah. There's a weird split in paleontology. It's either called ground up or tree down. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting split with uh, the paleontologists that focus on these specific lineages. Um, one of my favorites of the whole, like, what did they use these possible wings for and all that is a co- online comic XKCD. Yes. Where, like, child's reading a book and talking about it. And it's like, oh, back in my day, dinosaurs were this. And it's like, it's so weird they have feathers now. And then the child reads this passage where it's something like, oh, yeah, those feathers help stabilize it as it's sitting on its prey. It's flapping its wings to keep it down as it's killing claws or dismembering it. And I'm just like, yeah! <laughs> that is the first, the, uh, first, and I think only XKCD comic to include a scientific reference mm-hmm. to a paper. Yeah, yeah. The, Denver Fowler's paper. Yeah, the I... mouse over is like citation. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> which is really cool. But that, that lends to that idea of if you have these if you have these, you know, feathered little dinos climbing, like helping, helping their wings to climb up on trees and then plummet down or jump or something like that, land, hit, and flap to keep themselves down and to provide down pressure on their prey item as they're eating it alive. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the things we think of as being bird things like hollow bones and air sacs and you know those big powerful back legs and that really cool breathing system they have this unidirectional breathing system so instead of going in and back out the same passage it goes in this loop most of that have been seen in other dinosaurs you know that bone you break on thanksgiving (laughs) the wishbone that is a feature common among all bipedal dinosaurs T-Rex had a wishbone. It was big. <laughs> You'd have a hard time breaking it. You would need the whole family. But your wish would definitely <laughs> come true. And it freaked us all out when it was found. Because <laughs> all of a sudden, it's like, oh, that's a really big bird. Yes. <laughs> so almost all of the pieces were already in place to make a bird before. And exactly oh. where we say bird starts is very much arbitrary. Because I, it's it's bird, it's bird, it's bird, it's bird until it's not. That it's this spectrum. It's like trying to find where orange becomes red on the rainbow. It's impossible. I, pick a place. I Excellent question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> what will you need to major in to become a paleontologist? Oh, that's weird. Because up until recently, there wasn't really a paleontology degree program not in most places not in most places it was usually geology or environmental sciences and things like that i'm the weird outlier because i'm from a biology background same yeah yeah we're 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 weird because it gives us an advantage of like we know bones we know osteology the study of bones how muscle connections work that kind of deal but then we're out in the field, and they're like, okay, so you're in the, you're in the Williamson formation or the such-and-such such formation or anything like that, and you're kind of like, oh, crud, that's cool. right, rocks. Um, uh, okay, so these are the ones we're not licking, right? Yes. It's, that, it's that kind of thing. Um, but I know paleontologists that have zoology backgrounds, bio, like myself, art, Geo, sci- uh, hard sciences. Yeah. I know a couple of engineers yeah. who got into uh, paleontology later on and do like biomechanics stuff. I know yeah. a guy in, from the UK yeah. who started as a, I think he was a boat specialist. Like John? he worked on uh, Colin oh. Palmer. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. thought you were talking about Hutchinson. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, John yeah. Hutchinson, too. Yeah. Who now do cool biomechanics and ans- answer questions of like, how did dinosaurs carry their weight and how did pterosaurs take off? So. The classic roots are biology and geology, but you can come at it from all sorts of angles. Yeah. And we're always looking for people uh, to start becoming a paleontologist. Look around. Like, we have a lot of paleontologists that are biologists, a whole lot that are geologists and all that, but, like, biomechanics, not a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So you may be able to find, if you really like one thing, see if you can tweak it to get into paleo. Because then you can present an entirely new cross idea that makes us all go, whoa. What? And then we're like, oh, we never thought about that because we weren't X, Y, or Z. We're, 
or A, B, and C. <laughs> or paleo art. You can be a paleontologist and be and, an artist. And there is a need for that. There mm-hmm. really is. Yep. There's no shortage of people who want to draw T-Rexes tearing something apart, but there is so much more that needs to be depicted and so much more need for, for figures and visual representation of abstract concepts. So if you're interested in drawing at all and you're interested in paleontology, these things can be combined in some really interesting ways and you'll meet some really awesome people and get to do some really cool work. You suddenly get a tattoo artist. <laughs> <laughs> so what's it? What's the difference between a ty- Tyrannosaurus and a T-Rex? Noth- uh, well, it's ooh. Well, it, oh, well, kind no. of. The T-Rex so, is a type of Tyrannosaurus. Exactly. Tyrannosaurus is a genus. So, like, for example, humans, Homo sapiens sapien. We are the subspecies of Homo sapiens. So, so Homo sapiens sapien. Genus, species, subspecies. Yeah, so all animals and plants and most things have two parts to their name. Mm-hmm. So T Rex is a nickname. Yeah. So Tyrannosaur is-, is the genus. It's the group it's from. Rex is the species. So Tyrannosaurus Rex, because there's also Tyrannosaurus Batar, mm-hmm. which is a Chinese, it's a Mongolian T Rex. But it's not the same ones you find in Montana. So yeah. there's no difference between a Tyrannosaur and a and a the be- actually the best way I can describe it is all T Rexes are Tyrannosaurs. But not all Tyrannosaurs are T-Rexes. Yes. Like frogs and toads and turtles and tortoises. Yes. Yes. Uh, so what's the frontier in paleontology today? And uh, my daughter, she's seven. She wants to become a paleontologist. So what's the front? What do you expect? If you want to make a prediction, what's the frontier maybe 10 years from now, 15 years from now? Where do you expect it to go? Like the, like the bleeding edge of paleontology? What's the bleeding edge yeah. of paleontology? Whoa. Oh, man. We need wow. statistician, statisticians and geneticists. Yes, yeah. we do. <laughs> yeah. We do. Yeah. I, I have a friend, uh, we have a friend, who does ancient DNA, and I was talking with her at one point, and she, her comment was that she, she said, I feel like we're just now starting to figure out ancient DNA. Yeah. That we've learned a ton of cool stuff, but you can get DNA back a million, maybe even two million years, and within that, short period of time, right, that ice age, basically, you can learn all sorts of cool stuff, but she was telling me about like all these unanswered questions and all these new techniques that we're going to need to really unlock that stuff. Mm-hmm. So if you're into DNA, that's a good avenue to look down. Yeah, because in 10, 15 years, we'll be able to take these like literal tiny fragments of we don't even know what it is and possibly figure that out and see where it fits in, and then all of a sudden... Holy crap. <laughs> we will not be able to resurrect extinct species. No. No. I'm very sorry. No, we won't. We might be able to build something close, but we will not be able Ten to Ten years ago, mammoths were coming in the next five years. <laughs> Ten years ago, it was the next five. Yep. Seven years ago, it was the next ten. Yeah, it's yep. just like, stop. <laughs> Good question. Um, I'm sorry if you can't answer this, but can you give me a basic summary of um, the latest information on how the um, Permian extinction happened? Episode 45 of the Common Descent podcast. Absolutely. (laughs) It's all about the Permian (laughs) extinction. Um, Volcanoes. Yeah. Um, This is a time where Pangaea was breaking up, and when you have uh, continents splitting apart, the crust thins in the place where they're splitting, and that lets a lot of lava come through. Magma. And so you had just this enormous swat. Like, think of where the uh, Atlantic Ocean is now. All that area was full of volcanic activity that went on for thousands and thousands of years, just wreaking chemical havoc with the environments. Uh, The Siberian traps, absolutely. So that's sort of the leading contender. And then maybe some other stuff. Uh, Guys, just to let you know, Karen has uh, another engagement to get to. I know for X. She's Absolutely. going to be taking off to the Salt for X uh, variety show. Thanks for and letting I, me play. Thanks so much thanks for, joining for joining us. us. <laughs> but the three of us are still going to be sticking around for a little while longer. <laughs> Don't forget the name tag. Cool. So we, I have a... Do, uh, do we want to wrap up officially? At some what point is the most amusing scientific name for 
a prehistoric dinosaur <gasps> that you have oh. stuck in your head? Oh. I had an answer ready to go, and then you said dinosaur. <laughs> oh, no, I still got one. All right, go for it. Um, uh, humanum scrotatum. <laughs> Scro- scrotum humanum? Oh, yeah, scrotum humanum. Um, so, long, long time ago, um, <laughs> you had uh, Megalosaurus. And so this was before dinosaur, the, the term dinosaur was even coined. Uh, part of a femur. So where, where it hits the knee, it, you know, kind of got two bumps. Two bumps on the distal end, on the, on the far end of the femur. And it was a segmented bone. So you only had the two bits. So how do, I have to be clean. <laughs> the, uh, name, the name that was given to it yeah. by a curious person before dinosaurs naming officialized was scrotum humanum. And you can figure out why. Yeah, <laughs> a, a fossilized scrotum <laughs> humanum. That or glossopetrae. Glossopetrae, or fossil tongues, were actually shark teeth they were looking at upside down. <laughs> For like, nice. So, I mean, even though it's a podcast, we don't have any video. I have a tattoo of a prehistoric shark tooth right here. So instead of looking at it where this is the base and, that, and that's the tip, they thought that was the base, and that is the fossilized V form of like an ancient snake tongue or <laughs> reptile tongue. It was really weird. But hey, things have changed in a hundred or so years. We learned a lot. Yeah. Do you have a favorite dinosaur name? No. I, always... I was going to go... So I'm, this isn't a dinosaur, so I'm cheating. Um, do you anybody here like frogs? Yep. <laughs> so there oh, is yes. a genus of yes. toads today, and the genus is Bufo. And you get all these Bufo species. Bufo this and Bufo that. And Bufo, I'm pretty sure, is just Latin for toad. Mm-hmm. Well, there Bufo is Marinus. Bufo Marinus. Marinus. Yeah. Um, there is a an extinct toad from the late Cretaceous in Mongolia. No, uh, uh, Madagascar. I'm sorry, Madagascar. That was covered in all this rugosity, these bumps and stuff. It had these little horns, and it was huge, like 40 centimeters. Like that's a foot and a third. This giant toad, and the team that was digging it up was calling it the Devil Toad for a while, like jokingly between them because it was this giant horned toad, and the official name, this was Susan Evans and colleagues, the official name they gave it is Beelzebufo, <laughs> which is by far my favorite scientific yeah, name ever. That is a good ever. one. That's <laughs> so good. Oh, and here's a Dragon Con naming fun one. Um, there was a guy who named a genus of trilobite, mm-hmm. a new species of trilobite, uh, because it was found in some re- certain region of China, he called the genus is Han. Mm-hmm. And because it was the only species in the genus, he named it Han Solo. Yes, he did. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes, sometimes we do need to stop just right there. But. Oh, uh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> that is its that is the that name. is its real name just Micro like Tyrannosaurus Rex yeah <laughs> very nice cool nice that's okay mm, uh, have you ever c- came across uh, fossils that have been mysteriously broken and had weird gash and marks on them ooh, ooh. so you're oh, asking yeah. about pathologies yeah. injuries things that went wrong oh. Yeah, so (laughs) most fossils are broken. Uh, That's just a given for whenever you're digging stuff up. They're old, they've been buried, there's lots of weight on them, the earth moves, so most fossils are fractured and broken. But every now and then we do find unusual breaks or injuries on them. And uh, one of the, the, the most exciting examples of that is we will see marks on bones every now and then that are tooth marks, that are evidence of something having fed on it. And every now and then, very rarely, you can match up the tooth to the tooth mark and be able to try to figure out what it was that was eating that. We do have at least some turtles at the Gray Fossil site that have alligator tooth marks on them. Not a lot, but a few. Uh, Literally just recently, a paper came out with a pathological um, triceratops vertebra. And, um, And so... Vertebra have a neural canal that the spinal cord, spinal cord goes through. 
this neural neural canal had been shifted dramatically because of all the pokey infected holes around it from a T-Rex bite. The animal lived. It was bit and then survived and then died later. We have numerous examples, especially at the tar pits, of predation like that, of, uh, of healed wounds, horrible injuries. Bison uh, are some of the largest animals we find at the pits, bison, mammoths, and all that. But uh, dire wolves don't really go after mammoths very much, but they go after bison. We have a few dire wolf skulls that have been look like they've been kicked in by a ancient Western horse or a bison that have healed. So it's like you've got like the front the frontal cranial plate just smashed in, calcium deposits over it, and it's completely covering one eye. And this that that poor dog. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's also um Sometimes the you can get injuries that aren't caused by other species, we ha- or even other animals. Um, our friends Rachel and Laura studied the rhinos from the gray fossil site, and one of our best rhino skeletons has these injury. They, they had these broken ribs that looked like they broke and then rehealed during life. So it wasn't that it happened when it died. And they were looking at how modern rhinos get injured, and it had the broken ribs and it had some toe injuries that are the same pattern that we see in modern rhinos when they have mishaps while mating. (laughs) So our rhino probably fell over (laughs) and was clumsy, and that's a big animal, and it got hurt doing Mm -hmm. it. So you can learn all sorts of cool stuff. Now, there's lots of injuries we might never be able to identify because if you didn't survive that injury, if you fell off a cliff and broke your leg and then that was it, that's not going to heal. So we won't have any signs of healing to show that that was an injury that happened while you were alive. So it may be hard for us to tell that apart from a broke a break from a fall versus a break from thousands of pounds of earth upon you. So there are some that we may never be able to identify. They may be lost due to the process of fossilization. So uh, it's 945. Do you all still want to keep going? Yeah. Okay. Right, cool. <laughs> awesome. Do you want to come gather up front yeah. and get in close and say hi to us? <laughs> we can make this sort of the, the, the midpoint. <laughs> so make a line up in front of that mic, and we'll keep answering questions. Yeah. Uh, this is perfect. Like I said, like almost lips on the mic. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like get up real close. It's like if you want to put it near like the indentation of your chin. Yes. And then, yeah. Hi. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's real awkward. Yes. So it is extremely awkward. Um, We've so been doing it all day. I was w- <laughs> okay, but like everyone else has been like breathing on this mic already. Yeah. So like it's a little weird. It's but, a um, Dragon Con condensed in a mic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I was wondering, like, have you ever, or even discoveries just in general that have like kind of equally been like, that's cool, and oh God, that's also terrifying. Hmm. Good question. I understand that's most of it, but like... <laughs> I had a small scale version of that. Uh, this was terrifying for a, a reason you might not expect, but uh, at the fossil site, at the great fossil site, there are certain animals we have a ton of, turtles and tapers and stuff like that. But then there are others that we do not. We are strangely lacking horses, for instance. And in one of my first summers digging at the site, I found a horse tooth, which is now 25% of our horse material. (laughs) And when I found it, everything came to a grinding halt. And all of the big paleontologists came out to hover over my little, just barely grad student shoulders and examine what I had picked up. And I, then for the rest of the day, I had to dig with a teeny tiny tool to see if I found anything else. And the pressure for me to find more horse was ridiculous. Ridiculous, and I didn't. <laughs> so that was terrifying for a different reason. But every now and then we do find stuff where it's it's exciting, but also now the pressure's on to see if you can find more of that thing. And if you do, awesome. If you don't, everyone's a little bummed out. Uh, yet yeah, absolutely. Except mine's a little weirder. Um, so as I said at the beginning, I'm what's called a mitigation paleontologist. So 
uh, especially in California and other states, uh, there are state laws that prohibit the personal collection of fossils on public land or on private land even. Like, for example, California, you don't have the mineral rights, so anything you dig in your backyard is not necessarily yours. So when a large, for example, a very large building is being dug at the corner of 6th and Bixel in downtown L.A., and uh, you have to have a paleontologist there. And I was assigned to that specific dig. Um, and most of the time, nine times out of 10, 90 out of 100, 99, no, 990 out of 1,000, you find absolutely nothing or maybe a small flake of bone. Except this day, the bulldozer that was creating a six-foot-wide trench on one single push, there was this sickening noise as it crunches through a whale rib cage. Oh, no. Whale rib cage in downtown L.A. That's because when this whale was around, there was 1,200 feet of water where this was. Um, so the freak out and everything stops is me blowing a whistle and shutting down a construction site <laughs> until I can call my team and we have to grid out from where the one piece of bone is sticking out of the ground and start excavating in a paleontological form, which means we have grids that are one meter square, and we go down, every level is 10 centimeters. So it takes a really long time. And then on a small enough construction site, that shuts construction down entirely. On a larger one, we just have... 16, 20, 40 ton equipment moving around us in ever increasing, you know, uh, you know, decreasing circles as they get closer and closer to the dig site. It's very terrifying. But yeah, that shuts everything down because they have to stop because the fossils were there first. <laughs> Same thing. Uh, there's also, uh, so we fall under NEQA, nat uh, the, the natural uh, side of the laws. There's also CEQA, the cultural side of laws. So everything an archaeologist would do, you're digging along and then you, you find a burial site. Everything stops. We do the same thing with, uh, with non-human fossils as well. Good question. Yeah. Go right ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, so the, so the T-Rex, have you figured out if it was a girl or a boy? There, it is very difficult to know if any, when we get a fossil animal, it's very difficult to know if it's male or female. Sometimes we can tell because males and females are really different. So like at the gray fossil site, we were talking about the rhinos. That kind of extinct rhino, the males had big tusks on their lower jaw. So when we find big tusks, we can say that's a male. In fact, our two rhinos are named, we nicknamed them big boy and little guy. Is the, and they're, neither of them is small. Like, they're huge. <laughs> T-Rex, we don't know of any good signs to tell male from female, to tell boy from girl T-Rex, except for one specimen of T-Rex where a group of scientists looked inside one of the leg bones and they found a special kind of bone called medullary bone. And medullary bone is a type, it's like an extra deposit of calcium that birds develop when they're about to lay eggs. So the only animals that get medullary bone inside their bones, as far as we know, are females who are re getting ready to lay eggs. So that looks like the one time that we have so far been able to look at T-Rex bones and go, well, that was a female T-Rex, a pregnant female T-Rex. And it happened to be named Sue. I, I don't think that was Sue. Yeah, it was Sue. Was it? Yeah. Sue Sue insists on Sue's Twitter that Sue is... Yes. <laughs> yes. The, the Sue is now insisting on a neutral, but they did find medullary bone on Sue oh, as well. They? Oh, yeah. well, that's cool. She is right, non-binary. She is officially on Twitter. Sue is non-binary. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Right. Because it's still not 100% confirmed. And gender is fluid. So if the Allosaurus is bigger than the Tyrannosaurus, how come it has a weaker bite than the Tyrannosaurus? <laughs> <laughs> so Allosaurus is a big predatory dinosaur that lived way before T-Rex. 
And the biggest Tyrannosaurs were bigger than the biggest Allosaurs. Yes. Um, but you're right. T-Rex had this crazy, like, cow slicing yeah. bite force. And Allosaurus had a much weaker jaw. And that's probably just because they were hunting differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the same way that, like, you know, a hyena has a much stronger jaw than a lion does. Because hyenas are able to get at all the juicy goodness that's inside bones. Because their jaws can crack through the bone. Lions can't do that. Lions might scrape up some bone. Cheetahs have an even weaker bite, and they avoid bone altogether when they eat. Mm -hmm. So different jaw strength might just mean you're eating in different ways. Jaguar have incredibly strong bites because they do what's called a cervical bite. They go for the back of the head and pop it. Yeah. Ew. (laughs) Ah, yeah. (laughs) Oh, because it's... Look up the videos of jaguars going after caimans. Yes! And it's just a butt right through. Caimans do not have, like, soft heads. No. They have <laughs> solid skulls with a layer of bone across the neck as well. So you would have to bite through bone to get to that sort of bite. And that's exactly what they do. Go right ahead. Uh, first, uh, I love Allosaurus, so that's a, that was a good question. On your <laughs> um, uh, what is your favorite group of prehistoric animals? Like, I'm personally a fan of Titanosaurs and Ceratosians. I'm also throwing in non-dinosaurs if you want to go with pterosaurs, crocodilians, mosasaurs, whatever. Just I'm sub- purely subjective. What are your what are your favorite groups of prehistoric oh. animals? Well, we discussed crocs and snakes already, but Trevor, do you have a favorite? Um, it's I like I'm kind of kind of a fun cat guy, but honestly, it's 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 pachyderms, it's mammoths, nice. it's mastodons, Very it's nice. all the really weird stuff like oh uh, like uh, stegodonts. All that just bizarre, super big mammals, but pachyderm relatives. Because the idea of, like, you think a woolly mammoth is big. Whoa, no, the Colombian mammoth was even larger. And then you have the steppe mammoth, which was even larger than that. These things were 16 feet high at the shoulder. This is a huge elephant just tromping along in these inhospitable areas. They were probably very smart. Yes, yeah, well, I, if they're, if pachyderms... There, we use modern modern elephants not just to age mammoths because the tooth structure is nearly identical, but also to possibly infer different kinds of behaviors. Mammoths are just awesome, and there's there's a new mastodon species that we had no idea of, no clue. All of a sudden, one of my colleagues, Alton Alton Dooley from the Western Science Center out in Hemet. They have so much mastodon material, and he sees it every day. And then he just started thinking, wait a minute, these two things look really different. And he found out that we have our own mastodon, the Pacific mastodon. It's our own, like, kind of like slightly smaller, more pocket pocket mastodon. (laughs) It's awesome. And just (sighs) mammoths are cool. And the highlight of any field work I have ever done was going to Siberia and seeing a woolly mammoth carcass in the permafrost. That freaked. I cried. It's on camera. Wow. I am just like uh, just (laughs) losing my. Yeah. Trevor, you should come by the gray site where we have a brand new don't know what it is. Mastodon. Yeah. <laughs> I'll show you pictures when the panel's I've, over. I've I've heard. <laughs> it's and pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I I almost drove out here and if I did I was gonna stop by. Yeah, anytime. Yeah, but Come I on up. flew unfortunately. That also goes for all the rest of you. Come up to the Great Fossil site. We have Woo. a new mammoth, it's cool. Or Mastodon. Mm-hmm. You can tilt it down. There you yep. go. <laughs> Is it true that um I guess I mean spinosaurus are like the new discovered like king of the dinosaurs than T. Rexes. So that was no, that's a good question. If if spinosaurus is the new king of dinosaurs in place of T. Rex, uh, a, a bunch of that got started because uh, we've known about spinosaurus for a long time, but way back when the one really good fo- uh, skeleton of it got blown up during one of the world wars. World War II, World War II oh, no. it got bombed. And so so basically, we all of a sudden lost a lot of information about this big predator. So it's only been recently that we've started getting really nice specimens again and started getting an idea that it was actually 
really big, quite sizable. Uh, now, it is, you'll, a lot of times things are, like to promote that it is bigger than T-Rex. It was longer for the longest estimate than the longest estimate of T-Rex. That doesn't mean it was a bigger, more dominant predator. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's lots of things that point to that. One, it has a very different skull. Uh, T-Rex would have been able to crunch through bone. Spinosaurus would not have been a, doing that. So, like, Triceratops would have had something truly to fear from a Tyrannosaurus. Probably not as much from a Spinosaurus. Not that it would want to play with it, but right. <laughs> just because it's bigger doesn't mean it's usurped T-Rex. And fa uh, well, fortunately, T-Rex and Spinosaurus would never have had to vie for the title of king because they lived at different parts of the world. Spinosaurus is African, mm -hmm. T-Rex is North American, and at different times. Yeah. So Spinosaurus was long extinct before T-Rex showed up, which means they can both have been king in their own place. T-Rex would have been king of the north, sorry. And then Spinosaurus <laughs> could have been, Dorn. I guess, well, well uh, whatever. Dorn. Uh, oh, Dorn. Yeah, sure, Dorn. I was going to make a Black Panther reference. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. It, it, totally. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I mean, it, just you were, yeah, it would be Wakanda because um, you were going with Game of Thrones. Um, the, the, I'm mixing my, my references. Here. <laughs> the greatest crossover event of all time. Let's, let's not. <laughs> let's, no, let's not. Good I've, always, I've always found it funny that Predators get the title of king when really all the Titanosaurs would have been king. Oh, totally. Oh, like, yeah. the big, come on. Long neck dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah, they wouldn't even... The largest thing to ever exist is actually still existing right now. It's the blue whale. Yes. The things that wouldn't even notice these predators. Yeah. <laughs> Those yeah. are kings. Yeah. <laughs> and queens. Specifically, have you ever came across fossils of the short faced bear? Yep. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we have. Ursus, now. Ursus Arctos. Also known as the bulldog bear. Yep, <laughs> oh, exactly. Also known as the bulldog bear. This thing is terrifying. Like, <laughs> whoa. And a lot of people have not heard of the short faced bear. Here in, here in, I was going to say here in California, but no, nope. we find them a lot in California in the, in the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, this was a very large bear, it was taller than. So polar bears are currently the tallest bear. When a polar bear stands up, it is an incredibly tall animal. It's about 13 feet tall, um, or 10, 10 to 12 to 13. Um, Short-faced bears were taller. The grizzly bear is currently the largest bear. So there's a difference. For example, when we were talking about the spinosaurus being longer. In zoology and uh, animals, all of that, we differentiate longer or taller from larger. Larger means more mass. It is overall just a bigger thing. For example, David could be taller than me, but I am larger because I outweigh him by about 100 pounds. Um, no comment. Yeah. <laughs> the short-faced bear was taller than a polar and larger than a grizzly, and it could run really fast because it had long loping limbs. This is not a bear that would be waddling along and standing up and then suddenly kind of like lumbering after you. This was an open plains hunter that would see you from a distance and break out into a run. They're scary, mm -hmm. and I'm glad they're dead. Now, fun fact, our advisor, uh, one of our uh, professors at ETSU, Dr. Blaine Schubert, Oh, studies yep. short-faced bears, yeah. and yeah. the North American species, Arctotus, Arctotus is the genus, yeah, and you Arctotus get that up, yeah. up north. Uh, he was on a paper several years ago that discovered a South American short-faced bear that's bigger. Yeah. Arctotherium. Yeah. But Super bear. we should shout out to, at the Gray Fossil Site, we have fossil short-faced bears, and they are at best the size of a black bear. So these would have been some of the very earliest short-faced bears, the early ancestors of those giant super bears that were around during the Ice Age. So there are a lot of short-faced bears. There's one still around today. The spectacled bear of South America is part of the short-faced bear family. True. So you can go see a short-faced bear at the zoo, depending on the zoo. I don't know where they have spectacled bears. I can't remember the last time I saw one. <laughs> Sun bear. Ah. Mm. Good question. Mm -hmm. Very good yes. question. Thank you. Thank you. I want to know um, what y'all know about gorgonopsids because I <laughs> really like gorgonopsids. Very cool question. I 
don't. They they're a, they're a swing and a miss for me. <laughs> so Gorgonopsids are uh, were some of the dominant predators uh, going back. They were they were some of the dominant land predators before dinosaurs really rose to their prominence. Uh, they would have looked like a weird mixture between kind of a, a panther and a dog, uh, almost. And they were one of the first uh, land predators to ever show saber teeth. Uh, so that's something very unique about them. And they got very large and had lots of varieties. I don't know lots of details about what we know about them, but they were one of the main predators on land until they weren't. So if you go back to the Permian, so you're talking between... Yeah, Gorgonauts is like 260 million years ago. This, they, it, well, they weren't reptiles and they weren't mammals. They were synapsids. They were stem mammals, absolutely. So they were part of the group just outside of mammals. And so mammal ancestors kind of had the land ecosystems locked down until the extinction we mentioned before, the Permian extinction, which knocked them all out and left the room for the archosaurs to, to pick up, which then unfortunately uh, themselves got knocked down later. Um, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're Therapsidia, right? They're, they're yeah, therapsids. they're therapsids. Yeah, they're therapsids. That's as much as I know about them. Yeah. And they're named after Gorgons, mm -hmm. the mythical monsters of Greek mythology. I just think they're cool. They're, yeah, they're awesome. Fantastic. You are correct. <laughs> Thank you. All right. You can tilt it down. There you go. What is it like finding your very first dinosaur or like a whole skull or like a brand new dinosaur? There you go. I, That's the dream. I have found one dinosaur bone one time. So when I was in, um, well, because we work at the Gray Fossil Site, and the only dinosaurs we have there are birds, and we don't find those very often, mm -hmm. because that's after T-Rex and friends were gone. Um, I dug for a summer, I, uh, like a couple weeks, I dug out in the Morrison Formation in Colorado, which is Jurassic. Mm -hmm. And that was, at the Gray Fossil Site, we are digging with, like, uh, carpenter's travels. So the clay is very soft, and we're just kind of pushing through very slowly. At that site in Colorado, it was sandstone. So we were using chisels, and we would chisel away at it. And if we went for a really long part of the day without finding anything, we'd all back off, and they would bring jackhammers forward and just take a chunk down to see if there was stuff behind it. And I found this piece of bone that was maybe like this long, and they, they, the, the dinosaur experts there said it looked like a piece of a leg bone, probably from a sauropod, so one of the long neck, long tail dinosaurs. But there wasn't enough bone there to say which leg bone or which dinosaur it was. And that's the dinosaur bone that I found. <laughs> so how did it feel? It felt pretty cool. <laughs> because what that means is there is this chunk of unidentifiable bone that is dinosaur, some mystery dinosaur, in the Denver Museum in a drawer somewhere that I found. And that's pretty cool. <laughs> it, might actually, it could also be maybe a new species. So. It that's, could. That's the dream. <laughs> it could. Yeah, that, that's the dream. I mean, all of us would love to find something that's never been discovered before because and, that means we get to name it. And this is where I get to brag. I, d I did get to do that. Uh, it wasn't a dinosaur, though. My friend Steve and I got to name a new species of pre uh, fossil snake from the gray fossil site. And how did it feel? I love getting the question of how did it feel when you discovered the brand new thing? Because people think, right, you have this image in your head that you find the bone and you go, oh my goodness, something new. But the way it went for me and Steve was we were sitting in the lab and we had looked at like 300 snake vertebrae through the microscope and we came across these vertebrae and the eureka moment was... What in the world is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, Steve, this is weird. Come look. And he came look and he went, yeah, that's weird. And then we set it aside and we said, we will look at those later. And then like four years later, <laughs> we officially confirmed after lots of study and lots of peer review from other mm -hmm. scientists that it is a new species of snake, which is pretty cool. And to answer your question, because I heard you asked, what did we name it? Um, we, so every, like we said, every species gets two names genus and species. We named it Zelantophus schuberti. Schuberti is after Dr. Blaine Schubert. Nice. Mm -hmm. Who is one of our professors and the director of the museum. Ophis means snake. So a lot of snake names are Ophis, Pituophis and, and, and uh, Pantherophis and things like that. 
Zelant is a mythological winged serpent. And we did that because on the vertebrae, it had these little projections off the side of the vertebrae. And we were like, oh, those look kind of like little wings. It didn't actually have wings. It was just a shape on the vertebra. So we were like, that'd be cool. Give it a name. It starts with a Z. Zs are awesome. So we said Zelantophus. And that uh, backfired a little bit. Uh, funnily enough, it w we decided that. And then it went through the publication process. And during that time, I became a journalist. And then when it was time for the snake to come out, I, I went, oh, no. I didn't know because all the, the headlines said, winged snake found at the gray fossil site. Like, yep. Oops. But it's still a cool name. And I got to name <laughs> it. Right. Yeah. Good Thank question. You. Very good question. Ooh, you took notes. Uh-oh. <laughs> I had to find the article to see what I was talking about. Back in, like, April, I think, my friend sent me this article from The New Yorker called The Day the Dinosaurs Died. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I and, know which one this is. Yes. <laughs> and so I'm just... Tannis. I would like yes. to know what you guys think about it, because I heard varying opinions of what it all meant and how, like, true everything was. I would like to hear your guys' opinion on this. So my understanding of that whole situation is that it's a really cool site geologically, and it the, the authors, there was a new paper that came out that found this cool site in, do you remember where it was? Uh, Utah? One, Utah or some, no, one, one of those, Colorado? I thought it was an I state. Was it an I state? Somewhere in oh, wait, the U.S. Oh, wait, no, 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 it's Hell Creek. Is it Hell Creek? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's... Here yeah. in the U.S. No, it's a, it's a, it's a yeah, it's a, a, like, a lake bed in... in oh, North Dakota. North Dakota, oh, there North it Dakota. is. North Dakota, okay. Excellent. There you go. <laughs> so this is a site that appears to be a, uh, what looks like a tsunami deposit. So when tsunamis come through, you get all this churning up of the sediment, and things get deposited in really strange places... And there were uh, so so it appears to be a tsunami deposit, and they also found in the sediment the same what appeared to be the same signatures as at the KT boundary where you have the remnants of the asteroid impact. So what they were suggesting is this might be a deposit caused by a tsunami caused by the impact at the end of the Cretaceous. And the geologist I've heard from have said, that's pretty cool if true. Yes. That article got a whole lot of heat because the article, the, the, the popular article in The New Yorker, goes down a whole lot of paths that the paper doesn't talk about. So like the article's about how you know, the, there were dead dinosaurs and how this tsunami deposit buried this triceratops or whatever, and none of that's in the study. So I read somewhere that maybe that's in future work. Uh, like supposedly, supposedly there, there is more of it. Supposedly, there will be there will absolutely there will be more papers coming out about it. Is a geologically a remarkable site because there are four things you find that are evidence of an impact. You have shocked quartz. Yeah. Shocked quartz is literally it, it 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 only forms in an asteroid impact. You have tectites. You have gl little glass spiracles, which is superheated material falling out of the atmosphere and forming a ball, like a glass raindrop, and you have iridium. Those are the four telltale signs. All of this is buried and jumbled up in what looks like a wave deposit, or it could have been, um, oh, uh, you guys have them there, uh, a siege? Uh, when when a lake oh, oh, sloshes oh. back and oh, forth, yeah. yes, there is a word for that. Yeah, um, I don't remember the geologic term for it, but it's evidence of instead of a tsunami, it's an earthquake or a landslide from that kind of impact event causing a lake to slosh, kind of like a tsunami. But there is not a single dinosaur in the paper. Nope. Or like there may be one that was like found nearby. The big problem I have with that paper is that it was released before peer review process to journalists and a huge, like David said, a huge stink was made out of it. And 
we were all at like my Twitter feed lit up <laughs> with people like yep. news reporters asking me, it's like, what is your opinion on this? I'm like, I haven't even seen the paper. There's a, there's an embargo on the paper. You guys can't even be talking about it. How did this happen? And it was actually just a big colossal screw up yeah. an intentional colossal screw up. So it's probably a really cool site that has gotten very overblown and confusing press. Mm-hmm. So hopefully when the dust settles, so to speak, um, mm-hmm. it will be able to like actually learn some really cool stuff about it. I, I hope it's there. as cool as it sounds. Yeah. I, I read the paper. It's cool. It's a some kind of wet something happened to a something looks like an impact site. Other than that, I mean, yeah, there's a whole amount of fish that like mm. suddenly died in vertical orientation yeah. because they were uh, like things collapsed on them. And don't they have like the I don't remember if it was shock quartz or microtectites or something, but like in the sediment that uh, in, the, few, in like in the gills, they have tectites in the gills of the fish. Which is so cool. Which, yeah, it's like absolutely. <laughs> this they, is they choked on impact debris. Yeah, this is a evidence of impact debris hitting a small waterway or something. But we're not sure where they came from, whether it was a secondary deposit, whether it was a local impact, because a whole bunch of stuff would have been raining down. It wasn't just one big rock. It was a bunch of things coming down all over. Um, So, yeah, everything. It was a lot of... uh, a lot of speculation and a lot of con- strong conviction on what it was without it really being there. And that's that's the issue whenever we get uh, findings like this, even if it is, like, seems to be all on the level, is that if this were an example of a, a habitat sh- sh- that was uh, created or affected by that specific impact... That is a what we would call an extraordinary claim, mm-hmm. and we're going to want to double, triple, quadruple, and as many checks as we can on top of that, because that's a huge. That's going to have a huge effect on what we know about the extinction of the dinosaurs, and so running with exciting information like that is easy to do, but it is not what we want to do because we could really get uh, ahead of ourselves in making assumptions that turn out to be baseless. Good question. Very good so, question. So I've got a bunch of questions, so I'm just going to hop back in line once I ask this one. <laughs> um, about a month or so ago, I don't remember the exact amount of time, there was a giant fossil discovered in France. I believe it was a new titanosaur species or something else. It, it hasn't been named yet. I wasn't sure if you had any international associations that might have an idea of when it might be I, identified. I missed this. I don't know which. There's a lot yeah. of new titanosaurs. Well, it's just, it was just—it it was re- reputed to be like the—I think the biggest fossil femur or fossil leg Cute. bone. Uh, it was about the, sometime in the last like two or three months, but it was a pretty big deal. It hasn't been, as far as I know, it hasn't been named yet. So I'm just—I'm really—I'm on pins and needles waiting for it to be <laughs> somebody to. Whoa! Holy I don't crap. know which one. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, no thank you, so thank you very much. much. Uh, yeah, it's a two-meter-long femur that was found. Yeah. No, I'm 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 waiting to see what the name's going to be. So, so are we. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Well, I wasn't sure if you had any European colleagues that could, you know. That I, like, I, I haven't heard. Yeah, we have a Absolutely. bunch, but no idea. Wow. No, I hadn't even heard cool. about this. When do you have to go? Uh, concert's not till 1 a.m. Awesome. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, how is we our changing climate changing how you do field work? Oh. <gasps> Excellent question. I talked to an archaeologist uh, a couple of years ago oh. who was talking about how. Uh, who was talking about how. Um, so one of the things that archaeologists are often in the habit of doing is that they'll find a fossil site and they'll say, all right, this is really cool. Let's dig up a little bit of it and then leave the rest where it is because who knows 30, 40, 50 years from now what kind of cool technology and techniques we're going to have. And I was talking to an archaeologist who works on the north coast of Alaska, way up in the Arctic, and she was telling me that a lot of those sites that were left like that are now eroding out of the permafrost because the sea ice that's supposed to be there that would normally protect them from waves and stuff is there for less and less of the year, so the cliffs are eroding faster and faster. So now they have to dig up more. Now they're having to change their approach to go, 
All right, well, now we have to dig this up because it's not going to be here 30, 40 years from now because the climate up in that area is no longer a sustainable place for those fossil sites to stick around. Yeah, that's all throughout Beringia. That's all throughout the Siberian permafrost area and all that to the point where in Siberia we're actually we're losing specimens. Mm -hmm. yep. Like the permafrost is melting at an accelerated rate. So when, uh, especially with Ice Age paleontologists like myself, finding a, like finding a carcass is amazing, but you have to treat it very carefully. You have to clear it off while it's still frozen. You have to make sure it stays frozen because it will literally melt, and it's really gross. But when mammal, when mammal cells freeze, the ice crystals rupture the uh, cell walls and nucleotides, all that, and it all leaks out. And given enough time in a non-freezing environment, everything but the bones will just kind of, like, slough off, and it goes kind of gooey. Yeah, exactly, like frozen lettuce or frozen celery. You leave, mm -hmm. Then you leave it out, and it just goes, bleh. <laughs> um, so they're coming across melt sites where there are bones with only scant bits of fur and tissue on them. And, yeah, Simeon Grigoriev of the Northeastern Federal University um, sent me a handful of photos of what was a known possible site with literally a crumbled mammoth skull with a pool of who knows what surrounding it. Yeah, and just like leaking out, and it was just like oh. because of a permafrost cliff yeah. uh, cliff collapse, and because of warming climates. Yeah, <laughs> hooray! Now, on a slight, 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 slight silver lining, we are going to get to look into the Arctic more. Yeah, if things continue this <laughs> way, and Antarctica is well, we're yeah. Antarctica. To see yeah, more Antarctic. dinosaurs. In our, yeah. Yeah, Antarctic fossils, which we know are there. We found them, but it's hard to find them because a lot of it's under permanent uh, ice caps. On the other hand, a lot of places that are currently not good for forests are going to become better for forests, and that's going to tear up your bedrock, and we're going to lose more fossil sites. Yep. yep. Uh, let's go ahead and take – there are three more people standing up. Why don't we take these three questions, and then we can call it a night. Yeah. So Thanks. go right ahead. Thanks. Um, actually, you kind of spoke to it a little bit. How does a site get selected for a dig? I mean, do you do some prospect Ooh, work? Yes. Go in, ah, this looks like a formation that's Jurassic, or you know, the mitigations, obviously, but I mean, is there any kind of uh, remote sensing or ground penetrating radar, or, or no, that's how do you kind of go into a region? GPR that, is a fun topic. So how do you find a site? Out and, mm -hmm. and start, you know, uh, yeah, how do you find a site? So do you want to talk about GPR? Uh, yeah, I, well, I mean, real easy. Finding a site is fun because you go and look where other stuff has been found before. Mm -hmm. And it is, I won't lie, it's literally you get out of a truck, you start hiking around, and you trip over something. And it's like, oh, yep. dude, cool, bone. Um, but <laughs> so here. GPR, and that what we get a lot of questions about GPR, ground penetrating radar, because of that scene in Jurassic Park. Yep. Where it's like, boom. A few then, more years okay. of this technology, and we won't even have to dig anymore. Exactly. He said in 1993. Um, the problem with GPR is that the fossils... So a fossil, unless, you're, uh, unless it's a cave deposit where the bone has not been buried, permafrost or something like that, the bone has been literally replaced by the sediment that is surrounding it. So it's the sediment... It's been replaced by the sediment surrounding it and more sediment surrounding it. It's the same density as everything else around it. So it would just be a big black square. Yeah, yeah GPR does not work. It occasionally works in a permafrost environment only if the top uh, section of the permafrost is not frozen or is sand or something like that. Then you can see either a void, a permafrost deposit, or something but you're just seeing a block of ice. And you're like, oh, cool, there's more ice there. Let's dig there. Um, yeah, GPR, totally useless in 99% <laughs> of all applications. Yeah. Even in the gray fossil site where the bones have not been replaced by the same minerals as the sediment, they are distinctly different. The clay is so dense that it doesn't send back anything. Uh, so there's no way to predict. And uh, I'd say probably the, the vast way that fossil sites get found in a huge a number of the cases is what Trevor mentioned earlier and how the gray fossil site itself was found is construction projects. Uh, mm -hmm. Farmers, construction workers, 
that are digging in the dirt way more often than we are because there's more of them than there are of us, and they find stuff typically, and then hopefully mm. we get called in. Yeah. But not always. Yeah. Ring, I found something cool. Some of the times it's like, uh, my grandfather found something and we've been using it as a doorstop. Yep. Can you identify <laughs> it for us? I saw that episode of Dr. Quinn. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Good question. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Mom, this is a bit of a story, but one of my tarantulas died on Friday, so I'm basically treating Dragon Con as his Irish wake, you know, trying to celebrate his life. And in honor of that, I want to ask about arachnid evolution and um, especially spider Ooh. evolution. Like, what do you all know about that? Like, when did spiders first appear, first fossils, stuff like that? So this is one of those great questions where... Um, we get, I get to say I don't know, mm -hmm. but then I get to I, I get to extend it and say we don't know. Yeah, yeah no. spiders don't fossilize very well. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some spiders in amber uh, that go back to like the Cretaceous, like my, uh, Burmese amber, and they look like they were by that time doing pretty much the same stuff that spiders are doing today. I don't know that there's a whole lot of evidence of when spiders showed up or or big transitions in in spider evolution, just because. Fossil record is not kind to spiders. And oh yeah. One. Well, so with some fossils, you don't get good fossilization, fossilization because uh, the thing was delicate or something like uh, bats is one of those mm -hmm. where and and pterosaurs were very likely so delicate that they broke up easily. Other times, if you lived in a rainforest, the rainforest turns your bones into fertilizer, so you don't fossilize. Uh, spiders. A lot of people have. Uh, th hypothesized why they don't fossilize so well is because they put themselves very nicely off the ground in these webs and <laughs> and are not in really great positions to end up buried and fossilized because they are actively seeking out these environments and then building a little home. So they may have actually uh, accidentally removed themselves from the fossil record in a lot of ways. Um, Good question, though. My spider was a tarantula. Is there any fossil record of tarantulas? I don't know. We do. That I, mean, I do not know. Like I know that there are examples of of spiders going back to like the Permian and like or spider cousins that were probably I don't know ground dwelling, uh, but I they weren't tarantulas. You know, so things living like a tarantula, going back a while, but specifically I don't know any details. Uh, a shorter photo of the chimera arachnid. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Yes. Good question. Hopefully, in you know, ask again in five years, and ten years, and fifteen <laughs> years, and we'll see if we know this more. That's Burmese amber. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hundred million years. All right. Thank you. Yes. One last question. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to throw out my other question and go straight to what I like to refer to as Wild West paleontology. Okay. Um, 19th century paleontologists. Who do you prefer, Edward Drinker Cope or Othniel Marsh? Or uh, Wild card. Maybe you go with the third one. Mm -hmm. a third, a, a I was going to say, club. probably neither because they both seemed like jerks. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Mars, was <laughs> Mars was way worse. I, worse. Well, uh, being way worse than the other jerk <laughs> does not necessarily mean the other, me, I the other go, guy's a great guy. I got to go with Orkut. Ooh, good. Yeah, or, yeah, or yeah, yeah. Orkut was the nice guy. He was the traveling paleontologist. He went around to the common people and went, oh, you found something weird? Can I look at it? William Orcutt, um, and uh, he was responsible uh, for Rancho La Brea, for the La Brea Tar Pits. Um, he was traveling out west, and, you know, these ranchers found some weird stuff, and, ah, you know, they were just cow bones or something like that. Well, cow bones don't – cows don't have nine-inch-long saber-like <laughs> incisors. And he started looking around going, no, you've got something a lot weirder. Then all this. So then he went and talked to his friends up in Berkeley, who then came down in around 1903 uh, and started digging. And then that directly created the Natural History Museum of L.A. County in 1913. And, uh, yeah, and the tar pits ever since. Um, the tar pits are the world's largest collection of Ice Age mammal fossils, and they were entirely found in a 23-acre area. Over 4.5 million fossils found in one 23 uh 23-acre area at the intersection of Wilshire and Curson right off of La Brea. And the funny thing is, there's no tar at the tar pits. <laughs> it's asphalt. 
-hmm. Tar is man-made. It's made out of plant material. The asphalt at Rancho La Brea, the Ranch of Tar. So early Spanish settlers did not have a name uh, for variations of asphalt. So asphalt, pitch, bre it was all Brea. So they named it Bocones de Brea, the Volcanoes of Tar, and then was given to a local ranchero, Rancho La Brea, the Ranch of Tar. But it was naturally occurring asphalt. It's just oil seeping to the surface and getting sticky. <laughs> so there are no tar at the tar pits, and the La Brea tar pits is a pleonasm, which means the the tar tar pits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If we're picking uh, 19, so Cope and Marsh were the big old jerks. There was yeah. also Joseph Lady, oh, who was Jesus, yeah. the real cool mammaly focused guy yeah, who was rad. pushed <laughs> out of paleontology by Cope, Cope and, Marsh and Marsh being jerks. But if we, if you said uh, a 19th century. I mean, Paleontologist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I was going to say, beca before you specified, I was going to uh, go ahead and say Mary Anning. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because uh, our pioneer paleontologist was this wonderful woman who got no credit whatsoever until kind of. Yeah, big surprise, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, women weren't allowed in the Royal Society. So, how could she possibly become <laughs> well known for her work? Yeah, I found her first fossil when she was 12. She was awesome. Yeah. There's a movie coming out about her, which yes. I'm sure will be interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. Well, I think we're thanks, everyone, for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, Trevor, for being on the hey, podcast. Thanks. No worries. <laughs> thanks, you guys. Yeah. I can well, always call in, too. You. I'm only in LA. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.